Hey folks, Matt Easton here of Scholar Gladiatoria, of course. And as you'll see, I'm holding a basket help. Now I have done, uh, I did a video not long ago actually, I think a couple of weeks ago, about basket hilts. And of course I've done videos in the past talking about basket hilted swords. And um, that uh, provoked a certain amount of discussion amongst the, the guys over at the uh, Caterin Society. Um, and uh, Caterin, Caterin, I never know how to pronounce it, but anyway, the ISA Caterin Society, um, who are focused primarily on the broadsword arts uh, or the basket hilt arts. So backsword and broadsword. I think I've made no illusions about the fact that I am not even remotely an expert or an authority on um, broadsword or backsword sources. Um, I have studied some of the 18th century sources, but I have to admit I was primarily looking at those 15 to 20 years ago, so some of my memories of, of those sources are a little bit hazy. Obviously I've read some of them since. I've read uh, bits of Thomas Page, Zachary Wilde, um, little bits of McBain um, and uh, various other things, um, Matthewson, stuff like this in, in more recent times. Um, but the fact is that I don't specialise in this weapon. I don't train with basket hilt, really. Um, I focus on sabre. Um, but on that, you have to also recognise that within Britain, the sabre sources and the broadsword sources and backsword sources are related. They, they, they absolutely interconnect. So for example, if we look at Angelo, which in a way is the sort of, I see anyway, is one of the missing links between the two things, is that uh, Henry Angelo has a, a connection to um, broadsword traditions and essentially invented British military sabre. Um, so they are connected, the guards are similar, the stances are similar, but they're not the same. Okay, And there are certain things we get in um, broadsword and backsword sources which we don't really get in later um, sabre sources. Equally, in later sabre sources we have very much a lunge and recover system based primarily on a small sword um, lower body uh, system sort of, of small sword footwork which is not really found so extensively in the broadsword and backsword sources. You do of course have lunges um, but the footwork is a little bit different and there are certain things you find in the earlier sources for example slipping the lead leg which yes we find in Angelo and a couple of other sabre sources but um, by and large gets abandoned in the 19th century but it is very much prevalent in the earlier 18th century and some sources if we look at Thomas Page have very specific movement methods which we don't necessarily really see replicated in later sabre sources but as I mentioned the uh, discussion that this provoked me talking about um, basket hilts amongst um, certain people in the Catron Society who specialise in these actually has been very productive, I think. And thank you very much for sharing my video and discussing it, because that's, you know, that's why we do these kind of videos. Um, I'm not just, I'm hoping not to just talk into an echo chamber. I'm absolutely always happy to be corrected um, and have new information given to me because I love learning and I love weapons and I love history. So, um, I mentioned specifically these bars, okay? Now, I am aware, so initially, so I think probably about a year or so ago, I mentioned these bars and the fact that no one really knew why they were there. Then subsequently I found out that actually some people do have some theories about why those bars are there, or in fact, there might be some historical information about why those bars are there. Now, my assumption had previously been that those were the leftover, um, a sort of almost vestigial kind of uh, remains of finger rings from earlier kind of Mary Rose or 16th century basket hilts. Um, that's probably not correct, although it kind of, there could be a relationship there. Okay, now I became, a, I started thinking critically about these bars and I started thinking, uh, some people would refer to them as blade trappers and the fact that um, a blade that slides down here might get trapped in there. Um, or some people um, say that they may be for hooking shields, tages, um, and all sorts, there are all sorts of ideas, but people definitely have considered why are those bars there, what are they for? Um, and then um, Jay Maas from, um, from Canada, uh, who we're going to see in a minute, um, got in contact with me and said, well, you know, there are, th these, there are some sources that actually maybe give us some clues about specifically what these were used for, at least in the 18th century. Um, so, without further babbling from me, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand you over now to Jay, 
and he's going to introduce himself and he's going to talk a little bit more about these bars and this is part one of a series that probably have two parts, might even have more, where we actually look at basket hilts but specifically for now we're going to look at these bars. So thank you very much to Jay for getting in contact with me and uh, for offering to do this uh, video on my channel. I will also link his channel below because he does some really cool stuff. He is focused specifically in Canada on um, 18th century sources, primarily bar, not only, but primarily basket hilt sources. He also looks at spadroons and other cool things like that, but mostly 18th century stuff. And um, yeah, let's go over to Jay now and hear a little bit more about these bars and basket hilts in general. Hey everybody, I'm Jay, the head instructor of Broadsword Academy Manitoba. So I'm working with uh, Matt Easton on this video. And today we're talking about the forward guard of the basket hilted broadsword. So this piece is called the, the forward guard here. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as a sword catcher, a blade trap, or um, sometimes they'll even call it a claw. And there's a lot of myths that are about this piece of the hilt uh, particularly. So specifically, sometimes there's myths about it being a sword uh, catcher that can trap the blade and even snap it or break it. Um, so first off, that's not what it's used for at all. You won't, you won't uh, see any, anybody breaking blades with it, or at least uh, not intentionally. Maybe they could uh, hit it and snap, but you wouldn't catch it, twist, and tear it um, or, or break it in half like uh, some websites say that you could. Um, instead, it's used for a, a different purpose. So. Uh, before making this video, a couple of the people that I consulted or was talking to was Paul McDonald uh, in Scotland, as well as Heiko, uh, the, the president of the Caterant Society in Germany. And we kind of put our heads together, talked a little bit about some of the ideas I was putting forth. Um, so one of the things that uh, the most basic uh, purpose that it serves, which uh, Paul McDonald brought out, was that it, it basically covers these two gaps in the basket. There's two of them right here. So it covers it from downwards blows. And it also provides additional support uh, to the basket from that type of blow coming downwards, right? So it's extra protection for the hand. And that's pretty, uh, uh, I wouldn't say that that's necessarily obvious because uh, there's all these myths around it, but that's kind of the straightforward purpose of it. Um, but there's another use of it. So sometimes in, in rapier fencing, Matt Easton brought out in a couple of his videos that a lot of the times, um, when you're doing parries against the sword, they'll slide or glide forward on, onto your blade. It'll trap it right here, and then you offer your thrust, or you can do that in a single tempo together. So does that kind of thing exist in broadsword? Well, it does in, in the thrusting section of it. And I'll give you an example uh, right out of Andrew Lonergan. So Andrew Lonergan wrote a fencing treaties in 1771, and it's probably one of the most complete uh, fencing treatises that covers broadsword. Um, and at the end, it also covers uh, fencing for dragoons or light cavalry, uh, people on horseback. Um, so one example of a thrust like that being used is uh, a lesson for the dragoons. So it says, it's giving, uh, your opponent is attacking you here, and it says, or if he rushes upon you with a blow, which is a type of cut, uh, receive it on the fort of your iron basket with your wrist in tears and dart the same upon him at the same time. So it's basically talking about uh, a single time counter here. I'm using my, my basket hilt. I parry it with the basket. So it specifically says in that section upon um, on your fort or your iron basket. And the part of the sword that would catch on it is this uh, forward guard. The forward guard of the sword is where that would catch. So if I defend it in tears, it hits right here and I thrust forward. So actually Matt Easton was correct in his video that it was used like that, but uh, typically in broadsword, it wasn't used for that purpose because we were mostly, uh, we're mostly doing cuts in broadsword, okay? So the reason that this is so reinforced in this section is because there's actually techniques where the basket is used to defend rather than the blade of the sword, okay? So typically in parries, I'm gonna be parrying with this section right here, the strong of the blade, right? Or maybe the middle of the blade, anything as long as I'm carrying my true edge, right? Um, that's what I'm gonna be parrying with. But there's examples where I'm gonna parry uh, exactly right here. So one of them is when I'm defending my wrist, okay? So if, if someone's attacking me to the outside of my wrist, this is a nice juicy target in uh, broadsword fencing. And uh, you'll see that reference a lot. Archibald McGregor talks about it. Thomas Page talks about it, how uh, the Highlanders or broadsword fencers often target the wrist. Um, partially that's 
because it's the closest target, it's the safest to attack. Ferdinand says that. Um, but the other auth authors also talk about kind of a moral issue with um, hitting somebody to a target that could kill them. So it's better to disable the person and spare them their life than it is uh, to take their life in broadsword fencing. So that's one consideration of it. But the, the biggest thing is that it's the safest target to attack. It's the closest that's to your opponent. So instead of pairing with the strong of my blade against a, a downwards cut, what I do instead is just rotate the basket and I actually receive it on this part of the basket right here. Um, so I'm taking a direct cut to it. Um, so Matt also mentioned in a few of his videos a while ago that it was pretty common for uh, swords to actually get cut through the bars of the hilt. Um, so on a saber like this, um, this one's a 1882 pattern French infantry sword and it has a German nickel um, as, as the guard of it. So this type of, of sword, it wouldn't be uncommon to see broken bars on some of the antiques and this could even be cut through. Um, if, if it was a very solid hit, a very strong hit, it could potentially cut through the bar. And that also happened on steel basket hilts. So one of the reasons that this section of the sword is so reinforced is because it's expected to take a lot of blows right there. And in fact, it, it's not just incidental, those blows were actually being uh, guided towards there and parried directly on that spot, okay? So Lonergan, again, explains this. So does Ferdinand, and there's, there's a couple other authors that talk about these types of techniques as well, but Lonergan does it in the clearest way. So um, in his simple hits uh, section, he's talking about the very basics of fencing, the, the attacks and the parries. He says, and I throw inside your wrist, this you defend by only opposing the bottom of your basket inwards. So the bottom of the basket, if this was a basket, I put my hand through here, here's the top. This part is the bottom. So it would land directly on the forward guard there. So it says, defend this by only opposing the bottom of your basket inwards, by only a little turn of your wrist and return a cut at the outside of my wrist. So I parry that very quickly by turning the hand and I return with a repost. And the same thing was taught for um, his defense, which was to turn um, the basket outward and defend that as well. There's other examples of that um, from the book where um, he's talking about making single time counters to the arm. So uh, the opponent attacks you, you take advantage of that, cut inside their wrist and then immediately defend with the basket part of your sword rather than the blade. And there's a few different attacks from uh, one of the most interesting positions uh, in broadsword fencing, which is called uh, the spadroon guard. So a lot of the times the, the sword blade will be sunk and you're actually going to invite the opponent to cut over at the wrist. Uh, what you do from there is turn the wrist quickly, receive it on the forward guard of your basket, um, as well as um, parrying, like so I parry it, and then I repose to the arm afterwards. Um, so those are a few of the ways that it was used, and that was uh, definitely one of the purposes of it, was providing extra support so it wouldn't collapse. So all these things that we talked about, why don't we take a look at it uh, at the gym? We'll go over some of the techniques and some of the basics of it. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.